Hi everybody and welcome to Love Fraud Live. If you've been devastated by a sociopath in a romantic relationship, you may wonder if you can ever love again. I assure you the answer is yes. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll reveal a great truth about relationships, one that I hope will enable you to feel optimistic. As always, I'll answer your questions at the end of this short presentation. To join the chat or ask a question, please be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. So you've probably heard all your life that relationships are hard work. I'm not so sure that's accurate. What is hard work is preparing yourself for a healthy relationship. But once you've done the work on yourself, you may be surprised to discover that real love is easy. I am living proof. In February of 2000, I was divorced from James Montgomery. This man took a quarter million dollars from me. He cheated throughout our two and a half year relationship. He had a child with another woman while married to me. And then 10 days after I left him, he married that woman, which turned out to be the second time he committed bigamy. Yeah, I was crushed, but I was determined not to stay crushed. After I left Montgomery, I had one nice relationship with a man, although it didn't turn out to be permanent. He was normal, not disordered, and emotionally supported me through my divorce. I was really sad when the relationship ended, but it was a step along my path towards healing. Then, in April of 2001, I met Terry Kelly. We married in 2005, and last weekend we celebrated our 17th wedding anniversary. We went away for the weekend and had a lovely time together, as we always do. I posted a photo from our getaway in the Love Fraud blog, if you want to take a look. After 17 years, we are still totally happy and in love. From our wonderful marriage, I've learned this important truth. Real love is easy. In real love, there are no mind games. There is no manipulation. There are no guilt-producing accusations like, don't you trust me? Or, who are you sleeping with? There is no pleading to be forgiven, no promises to never do it again, because there are no violations of trust that require forgiveness. I do not wonder if my husband really loves me, because I know he does. I can feel it. Here's what you get in a true loving relationship. Enjoyment of each other's company. Honest caring for each other. Consideration of each other's feelings. Real partnership. Not a one-sided deal with you doing all the giving and the other person doing all the taking. Sure, there are problems that need to be solved. Guess what? Issues are resolved and life goes on. There is no drama. I will say this. After the disaster of my marriage to a sociopath, I am highly appreciative of my new husband. He too was previously married. And now we both appreciate each other. In fact, we find joy in each other. So how does this happen? How do you make the transition from a wounded victim of a sociopath to a whole person ready to love again? Well, as I've talked about in many previous videos, I believe recovery happens through processing our emotional pain. Every wound we ever suffer causes emotional pain, which we carry around, unless we get it out of our system. The betrayal by my sociopathic ex-husband 
was so great that I could no longer carry the pain. When my heart shattered, all the trauma from my bad marriage and all the pent-up pain from other disappointments in my life was released. It came pouring out. I cried, I moaned, I yelled at my ex even though he wasn't there, I punched pillows. It's not pretty and you don't want to inflict this display on other people. When I did it, the only witnesses were my therapist or my dog, and it really upset the dog. If you want to know more about how I recovered, I explain it all in my first book, which is called Love Fraud. It's available as a printed book, ebook, or audiobook. You can buy it on lovefraud.com or Amazon. Emotional release takes time because we all have many layers of pain. But as the negative energy dissipates, there is room in your heart and in your soul for something else. And that something else is love, real love. If you're in recovery after a run-in with a sociopath, please give yourself time and permission to heal. Trust that you've learned the red flags of personality disorder and by listening to your instincts, you won't be deceived again. Believe that real love is possible and someday it will find you. And then remember this bit of wisdom that will help you to decide if a new romantic partner is authentic and true. Real love is easy. That's the presentation for tonight. Like last week, I wanted to offer you an uplifting topic. If you're in the process of escaping or recovering from a sociopath, I want to encourage you to keep going. Yes, recovery is messy, but it's absolutely worth your time and effort. Next, I'll answer your questions. If you have a question, please be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can participate in the chat and ask your question. Okay, so Chanel says, my therapist suggested that my husband has psychopathic traits. Does this make him a psychopath? And is it possible for a sociopath to have psychopathic traits? I would say that if your therapist is saying that um, your husband has psychopathic traits, then that's a good enough reason to conclude that he's disordered and uh, definitely not something that you want to continue being involved with. Um, therapists often need to be cautious about how they describe someone else. Uh, the rule generally is that they can't diagnose someone who is in the room. Um, I think that's often unfortunate because there are times when it's pretty obvious that someone is disordered uh, once you get the story of what they're about and, and what they've done. Um, because it does tend to help people to be told or validated, I should say, validated that your suspicions are correct, that the person is a sociopath or a psychopath. Um, but I would say that what she said, what the therapist said to you is, is close enough. And, you know, from that, just assume that the person is disordered. Now, I use the word sociopath as an umbrella term for multiple personality disorders in which the people who are affected by these disorders exploit and manipulate others. So a sociopath is, it's no longer an official diagnosis, so I'm using it as an umbrella term. And um, it covers antisocial, narcissistic, borderline histrionic, and psychopathic personality disorders. And the reason that I use that terminology is because for most of us who have been um, traumatized and exploited by these individuals, the precise diagnosis really doesn't matter. I mean, there's a lot of overlap among these conditions and 
a therapist needs to know exactly what she's dealing with um, in order to provide adequate therapy. But for those of us who are just trying to recover, it's like splitting hairs and the precise diagnosis doesn't really matter. So um, Chanel, I would say that you have all the information you need. The, the guy is disordered and the best thing that you can do is put him out of your life. Okay, so then Chanel says, I never experienced real love, not even from my parents. I never saw a healthy relationship and I'm afraid I'll never have one. That's actually fairly common among folks who've been in relationships with sociopaths. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to people who realize that they married someone just like their mother or just like their father. Um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge that you'll need to overcome. So the first step is learning to have a loving relationship with yourself. And that means to treat yourself well, to um, be supportive of yourself, to put your needs first, to do what you need to do for your own health and recovery. That's the first step. And then I guess you observe, you, you go around and look at other people and, and see if you can find examples of relationships that seem to be healthy. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic relationship. Um, you know, people who have good relationships with with kids or with coworkers or anything along those lines. But have your eyes open and look around. Um, yes, it's difficult to realize that your parents didn't necessarily have the ability to love you the way you deserved. And that's really unfortunate, but look around and maybe you can find good examples elsewhere. Oh, so Kaina says, uh, can you do a topic on the Tinder swindler? Um, I actually haven't seen it. I don't have Netflix. So I'll have to uh, look into that. Maybe there's a summary someplace. But I can tell you, um, I can take a guess at what it's about. And uh, based on my more than 10,000 cases, I I'm sure I have uh, similar stories to what went on with that um, in that um, show. So I'll, I'll see if I can find something about it. Oh, so Marcia says, how does a sociopath treat a woman on Valentine's Day? Well, that would depend on what the sociopath's objective is at the moment. Um, if the sociopath is in the process of reeling you in and trying to get you hooked, 10 to 1, he would go over the top on Valentine's Day. He will uh, call and get flowers and candy and, uh, and arrange a, a, um, a, a romantic dinner and, and really try to reel you in. Now, that's if he's in the process of trying to seduce you. If, on the other hand, um, you're already involved with this person um, or he's you know, getting ready for the discard, he would probably just ignore it. Um, it's quite possible that they could like not even show up, not even call, not even say happy Valentine's Day. So it all just kind of depends on where the sociopath is in the cycle of um, the sociopathic relationship. And that cycle is that in the beginning, it's over the top attention, it's love bombing, and they later on it just gets kind of stagnant then finally at the end it's the devalue and discard section where they're done with you and ready to throw you away so how they um 
behave on a particular Valentine's Day would depend on where they are on that story arc of somewhere between love bombing and discarding. Well, it sounds like Frances had an experience escaping from um, her ex. I'm glad that you had your uncle who was able to help you um, as you were leaving because, um, you know, at times like that, you need all the help you can get. And, and if somebody was able to help you um, with escaping the sociopath, then that's, that's a really good thing. And, and I'm glad for you. So, you know, this is a topic that I've been wanting to talk about the idea that, you know, recovery is possible. Um, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes, you know, we feel like we've gotten ourselves into such a deep hole and there's just so much to try to overcome. Um, I mean, the emotional part of it is one aspect of the recovery, but then there's the other aspect of recovery, which is dealing with all the practical issues. Um, you, you, you may have been wiped out financially. The guy the, or the sociopath, sometimes it's a woman, um, the sociopath may have put you in debt. The sociopath may have cost you your job, may have uh, ruined your relationships with other people, uh, family and friends. So I like to say that there's actually two parallel paths to recovery. Um, one path is what I just described, all the practical issues that you need to deal with. And the second path is the emotional recovery. It is possible to travel both of these paths at the same time. It is possible to work on solving all the practical issues at the same time that you work on your emotional recovery. In fact, any progress that you make on one path will help you with the other path. Like for example, folks may feel like you have to like get the divorce done or get the guy arrested or, or uh, get all the finances squared away yeah, you do all that and then you'll deal with your emotional recovery. Well, I don't agree with that. I think you can work both at the same time. And if you do work on your emotional recovery, it'll may mean that you're more centered and you have more um, calmness and, and internal wholeness, which will help you to see solutions to your practical issues. So they work in tandem and it's a good idea to do to follow both paths at the same time. Okay, let's see if we have a question here. So Noreen says, after breaking up with my ex last May, he stalked and harassed me for four months. He was arrested and did four months in jail. He got out in December. I have a no contact order and he is blocked on all social media. Well, that's really great. I, I, I'm sorry that you went through what you did. Um, I'm glad that you were able to get him arrested. Um, some people aren't able to accomplish that. So I, I'm glad that the authorities were responsive to your situation. And um, I hope he stays away. Um, in any event, you need to decide that you will have nothing more to do with him. Um, I've heard of folks who, you know, after, after the restraining order expires, you know, they say, well, you know, maybe we can be friends. And I say, no, <laughs> no, you, you don't want to do that. Um, the last thing you want to do is get anywhere near someone who has been stalking you. So figure out a way to stay strong. So Marcia says, how did you emotionally get over the feeling of being duped and being taken advantage of financially for $250,000 from the sociopath? How do you not become bitter? Well, 
uh, believe me, I felt really badly about the fact that I was duped. I was angry. I, w I tried really hard to collect my money because I did win in court. I, the judge awarded me all the money that was taken from me plus a million dollars in punitive damages, which is, believe me, highly unusual in a divorce. And I went after him. I, I went after my ex. Um, he had moved out of the country, so I had to get international lawyers and international private investigators. And I failed. I failed. In the end, all that I recovered was $517. So you just have to accept it. And, and, and that's actually when I really collapsed, you know, because all that time that I was searching for the money, you know, hoping that it would make me whole and that I could get out of debt and, and everything else, when I had to accept that there was no money, I was never going to find it, that was pretty painful. But that was also what allowed me to really do the emotional recovery because it's that, that holding on to wanting justice and holding on to wanting things to, different, to be different when you're, when you're able to let go of that, that's when you have the real recovery. Okay, so Noreen is asking, will he finally leave me alone? Um, unfortunately, that's really difficult to predict. Um, I mean, you've got a four-year restraining order, so hopefully that's enough. Hopefully he'll just finally go away, but I have heard of situations where they don't. So essentially you've got four years to figure out how you're going to protect yourself. And actually the main thing that you can do to protect yourself is to work on your emotional healing because If you can get centered, you, you won't have that energy inside that the sociopaths are attracted to. I mean, this, the sociopaths are attracted to all that pain that we carry and the wounds and, and that's where they set their hooks and that's where they try and get us and, and promise to make all our dreams come true and promise to take the hurt away and, and everything like that. So if you're able to work on your recovery there's nothing for them to latch on to. And that's probably about the best thing that you can do in order to protect yourself. Okay, well, that looks like about all the questions that we have for tonight. I thank you everybody for joining me this evening and I look forward to next week and hope you'll be here for the next episode of Love Fraud Live. See you later. <laughs>